All right, everybody. All right. <laughs> okay, good to see everyone. Thank y'all for being with us tonight. Um, the way that we did this last time is the way that we'll do it tonight. If you have a prayer concern, you got to speak it so that I can hear it. And then I will we'll say whatever your prayer concern is. And then, um, Lord, in your mercy, and you respond by hear our prayer. Okay? So who's got a prayer concern? I know Bobby does. And who is that that has the brain tumor? What? Jackie Whiting. Jackie Whiting. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. Who else? Our son, Adam. Our, I'm Adam. Adam. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Who else? Carl Loggins, Lord, in your mercy. Okay. Anybody else? Cameron Haley, Lord, in your mercy. The family of Chuck Asher, Lord, in your mercy. What's going on in Ukraine? Lord, in your mercy. What's going on in our country? Lord, in your mercy. Willie Glenn, Lord, in your mercy. Turkey and northern Syria, Lord, in your mercy. Our brothers and sisters in the Christian community in the West Bank, Lord, in your mercy. Children in the Hope School, Lord, in your mercy. Unspoken, Lord, in your mercy. The church, Lord, in your mercy. Let us pray together. Lord, we come to you. We thank you for being our God. We thank you for a wonderful evening and a fellowship around the table. Um, just a joy to be around those kids that have so much energy, Lord. If we could just tap into that just a little bit. Lord, we um, ask your blessings on those kids especially that wouldn't be here tonight if it weren't for some adults that either pick them up or encourage them to be here. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and for a wonderful meal. Thank you, Lord, for friends new and old and for friends that we have not had the opportunity to meet until Sunday or later. Lord, we ask your blessings on those that prepared the meal. May that meal nourish our bodies and help us to be a part of those to your service. We ask all of this as we pray your prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Wonderful. Okay, how many of you think that our grandbaby is going to be a boy? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you think our grandbaby is going to be a girl? Raise your hand. The girls have it. <laughs> We're going to have a little girl in September. So we, we are so excited. And, and we found out today we hired a witch doctor. And um, they opened up the rabbit and read the entrails. And that's how we know. So... No, it is going to be a little girl. We found that out just a little bit ago. So we, y'all, the first group I get to tell. So I'm very excited about it. So, all right, that's awesome. All right, we're doing chapter five tonight. It's called the Great Reversal. That's what Christianity is. It's the Great Reversal. Remember the the. If you're going to be first, that means you're going to be what? If the last are going to be what? Those on top are going to be on the bottom, and then everything changes around because Jesus changed everything around, and his way of looking at things was extremely different than the ways that we look at things and also the way the world looks at things. So we're looking at chapter 5. Now, 
we, we really, like with other Bible studies and things like that, if, we'll try to do some questions before the end. It just depends on how far we get. My goal is to finish through chapter 5, um, and then because I'm preaching chapter 6 on Sunday. So let's, um, we'll go this as best we can. Philippians 2, 5 through, oh, let's, I tell you what, let's sing a chorus. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Y'all sound really good. All right. Philippians 2, 5 through 11, you know this. Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. All right. Now, we're fixing to go to the next section. Okay. What does that mean? What does that mean? Remember, um, Sunday, we talked about it very briefly, that a lot of modern and non-Christian religions believe that, that we have to work so that we can raise ourselves to God. Remember Tower of Babel. You add another level and another level and another level, eventually you get there. That is not the Christian way of thinking. What is the Christian way of thinking? That God, look at this, emptied God's self to meet us where we are. And that was done through Jesus the Christ. A lot of times I'll say Jesus the Christ because a lot of people think Jesus Christ, Jesus is his first name, Christ is his last name. That is not true. It is Jesus the Christ. I only do that to just make you mad. But I want to remind you of that Jesus was the Christ. Jesus the name. Really, his name would have been Jesus of Nazareth. And so that's why I often say Jesus the Christ. Okay, Philippians. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point, some versions say unto, to the point of death, even what? Okay, one of the most humiliating forms of torture and punishment. Why? Why? The Romans loved crucifixions because it humiliated the individual. They were crucified naked. Remember, I told you our versions of the cross are all wrong. The crosses were less than this high because those that crucified them wanted the crucified to know that they were so close to the ground, but they couldn't get there. And they would crucify you almost just above the ground, not high up on a cross, because that didn't make any sense. They would crucify you so that passersby would see you and understand Rome has the power to do whatever it wants at Rome's will. Does that make sense? So you see, death upon a cross, it was reserved solely for the worst. And remember that the Romans... There were times when they crucified 500 people at one time. They would crucify a person every mile between cities that they conquered. And so that the people would understand that they have no opportunity to rise up. And that's why crucifixion is so heinous, and that's why it's so horrible. The individual would basically um, suffocate. As they, st I mean, sometimes a crucified person could survive three days. And it was horrible because your, your diaphragm would eventually give out, your leg muscles would give out, and you would crush your diaphragm. That's how death in crucifixion occurs. Remember the mercy blow. Do you remember that? You've heard that before? That's when the Romans would break the legs of the crucified person. That way they couldn't push up anymore, and they would die quickly. But Jesus was already dead, Remember? And so that's why that didn't happen. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. Who's him? Jesus. And bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of whom? 
every what? Knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is an ancient uh, mantra that was used in the early church, and it's beautiful, and it's preserved for us by Paul. And that is an ancient um, um, creed that would have been used in the early church. There are a couple of hymns, there are creeds. We find them in a lot of Paul's letters. What were the, what were the oldest pieces of literature in the New Testament? Do you remember? What was written first in the New Testament? Oh, come on, I've told you, you know. Come on, I'm act like a kid and do my knees like this. No, no, no. Paul's letters. Remember, they were written less than 50 years after Jesus died and rose again. Remember that the Gospels weren't written up up until 60 or 70 years. Um, John in 80 A.D. And so the Paul's letters are the earliest evidence of what was written in the New Testament because they were passed around to churches and read to different churches, and particularly the ones they were written to and all the others. Okay, so the first heading in our chapter is the Gospel of Mark. And this, the theme of Mark is to serve, not to be served. Remember, I've told you about Mark is the oldest of the gospel writings. Um, it is the earliest, the ear, I mean the oldest and also the earliest. It was written to be read in one sitting. So when you're ready to start reading some scripture, read Mark and read it as fast as you can read it. That will help you better to understand it. John, it takes you five days to read John because it's totally complicated and it's very complicated. Mark, blah, blah, da, 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 read it as fast as you can. You will pick it up better than anything. Richard B. Hayes, God's invasion of the world has wrought an inversion. God has reversed the positions of insiders and outsiders. In Mark chapter 3, the leaders of the people reject him, but who comes to Jesus? The common people. Because they don't have a hope. When you got money, you got hope. When you have money, you usually have hope. Um, All of us in this room, if something happens to us, we have something to fall back on. There are many people in our world, in our society, especially outside the United States, that if one thing happens, they're on the street. Now, that's the, the horror of what happened in Turkey and northern Syria. Because think of all the homes, and those people have nowhere to go because their families, the the immediate family, and then their other parts of their family have lost everything. And, And now they have nothing, and they have to start completely over. You know, like I said Sunday, most of us are where we are because of investments made by our parents or our grandparents. We have been given something. And so that's the beauty and the the place where we are, which is a positive and a negative. Uh, He also said the people who should be leading are behind. I love this statement. The people that should be leading are behind, and the people who should be following are where? In front, because they're hopeless. And when you're hopeless, Jesus is very appealing because he says, you know what? You have value. You have value, and you are worth something. In fact, you are worth so much that I will give my life even for you. Do you see how powerful that is? And it draws us into a relationship with him. It's so important. Mark's gospel redefines the nature of power and the value of suffering. He chooses powerlessness over power. Remember, I love that old um, gospel hymn. He could have called 10,000. You remember that? You remember when they used to sing that? He could have called 10,000 angels, but he chose to die. What? I forgot the next line, so it doesn't matter. All right. Um, The vision is a moral life, a moral life, and it's profoundly ironic. Because in this life of Jesus, those that have power, they show they have power by being humble. And those that are humble, they have power. Remember, I told you several weeks ago how crazy it is when somebody says, I am so humble. (laughs) 
I had a, I worked for a guy one time that he always told everybody he was in charge. What do you know about that? When somebody has to tell you you're, they're in charge, what does that mean? They ain't in charge. <laughs> uh, you got that right. Okay, the Gospel of Luke, um, a little bit different narrative. Um, remember Luke, and Luke wrote what two books? Luke and ACTS. Luke and Acts, good. Um, and they were actually one piece of literature, like chapter 1 and chapter 2, Luke and Acts. But they separate it because John deals with the life and ministry of Jesus and the disciples. So that's why it's ordered in the Scripture the way it is. Luke and Acts were written at the same time about the early church. Luke is about Jesus. What is Acts about? The Acts of the Apostles, um, Peter, also mainly Paul. And Jesus a little bit in a couple of verses, and then we go to Peter and then to Paul. And it goes and it tells the history, the story of the early church, and then all of Paul's journeys to spread the gospel to all parts of the world. So the gospel of Luke, the first shall be last. In Luke, perhaps more than any other gospel, we see Jesus' love for outcast. Give me an example of that. The last will be first. He loves Samaritans. He goes through Samaria. No good Jew would go through Samaria. Remember that? No good Jew would go through Samaria because the problem would be that when you go through Samaria, what do you run into? Samaritans. Samaritans. And you certainly want to do that. Tell me about tax collectors. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Savior he was to see. What's the next of it? Um, and then as the Savior, he walked by, and he looked up that in that tree, and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down. I'm coming to your house today. No good Jew would go into a tax collector's house because if you did that, you risk. Well, you wouldn't even risk. You would become unclean, and you would have to ritually be cleaned again before you could go into the temple. You understand that? So you didn't go because what is tax collector? What does he deal with? What does he touch? Roman money. Roman money. And Rome was the, you know, the aggressor, and Rome was the one, the occupier. Also, Jesus in Luke, um, really it doesn't mention children in the other Gospels, but here we have in Luke, Jesus says, come unto me, the children, you know, whoever messes with them, it better be that you have a millstone placed around your neck. Amen. And so children, also women, um, Samaritan woman, that, that's two categories right there. <laughs> of um, um, not good. And then also Luke deals with the poor. He also deals with medical issues. And most of his, um, most in Luke, most of the things about the demonic possession that in Luke is usually sounds very similar to um, epilepsy, um, other forms of medical issues going on in people's lives. Also the woman with the bleed, with, with, she'd been bleeding for many years. Um, people like that, and, and Luke deals with those things more than the others. Also, and so, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. All right. Now, remember, this is a weird text. When I was going, when we, how many of you went with us to Petra a couple of years ago? Remember? And we went over to Mount Nebo, and we stood at Mount Nebo and looked over into the Promised Land. That's where Moses was. And what is, what is there on that mountain? Do you remember? Do you remember what's on that mountain? A snake. That's right. A snake on a cross. That's right. Why would that be? Okay. John 3, 14 and 15. Remember, he's referring back to Numbers 21, 9. Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. What happened? Snakes were coming around to the children of Israel, and they were biting them, and they were dying. That's never good. And so then, so Moses put this snake up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and they looked at the bronze snake, they lived. Okay, weird story. Can we just admit it? That's weird. We don't necessarily understand that story because it sounds like to me that he's created an idol. Yes? Yes. That's not what Moses was doing. Look at John 14 and 15, 3. Where he said, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so what John has done and the early church has taken that passage from Numbers and pulled it into the early church and said this was also a text 
the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes or looks upon him may have eternal life in him. And so what the early church did was they saw the numbers passage as something very important and pointed for them to the Messiah that was to come. And so that strange passage in in Numbers all of a sudden becomes a Christian proof text for the early church. And if they thought it was important, then so should we. Now, what, what is the snake on the stick on the cross? What is that the symbol of today? That's right, the medical community. And that's where it's from, Numbers 21.9. When you look upon the bronze snake, um, if you have been bitten by the poisonous snake, you will not die. Okay, and then, so it also, there's a, a couple of other texts where snake handling churches, you know, and we will evolve into a snake handling church soon. And um, you can, that's, we can only hope. Walter has agreed he would be the first to handle the vipers. All right. And so if I come into church with a basket and it's going, you know, um, that is my last Sunday and I have lost my mind. Okay. The irony of the remedy, and a remedy, and this is so cool, and this is one thing like this book is pushing us to think about. They would be healed by looking upon the very thing that was causing them problems. So they had to look upon the thing that caused them problems. The whole incident hinted that God would just, just not remove the curse of death, but would somehow bring a blessing through the curse of death. So as we look to the Christ for our salvation, it saves us from eternal damnation, which is ultimate death. Are you with me? The way we're saved, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not. Huh, isn't that weird? Isn't that weird how that ties together? Isn't that weird how the Bible ties together? That's so weird. Okay. The gospel of the great reversal. Okay, this is what our author's talking about with this. Good news of who Jesus is. Romans 1, 3, and 4. Jesus is the eternal son of God. Eternal, how do we know that? How do we, what does eternal mean? Lasting how long? Forever in the future. Also, eternal means what? Forever in the past. Remember, I talked Sunday about how we look at things oftentimes horizontally, but God's bigger than our view. We can never see eternity. Our view is so narrow. This is our view. When I have a migraine, this is what happens to me. My peripheral vision comes in and I can't see things on the side. And I'll know that it's coming. I know some of you have migraines, so you know what I'm talking about. All of a sudden, you'll see little spots every now and then when you look at things. And, and I don't get nauseous. I don't do any of those things. But what happens is my peripheral vision comes in. And that's how I know it's going to be bad. And so I've got this stuff that if I take it before, when I see the spots, if I take that stuff, and I forgot what it's called. It's an old medication. It'll keep me from having it. And I'm not one of those that has to get in the, you know, some of you have to get in a dark place, you know, and close all the windows and, you know, can't have sound or light. I know some of y'all suffer through that. I don't, I, but I, I can be okay in a light place. But if, I, if it goes full blown, I just, just feel awful, you know, not nauseous, but just terrible. And see, that's what he said. He is the eternal son of God. We can't see eternity because our view is so narrow. We can't see the beginning. All we see is what's right in front of us. And the only way we can change our view is if we turn our bodies or our heads. And then we still are limited at what we see. God sees eternity all the time. God sees the beginning, the middle, and the end all the time and remember that human life in the scheme of things is an infinitesimal spot in that long history of the world so you're 80 we had two 95 year olds sitting at this table today at um, 
um, the, the thing um, at the, the Lenten lunch. And one was 97, one was 96. And there's a couple of months when they're one year apart. And I, I said to both of them, I said, I said, did you think when you were 16 years old that you would live another 90 years? And they looked at me like I was crazy. And, and they said, no, <laughs> because we didn't want to then. <laughs> They've outlived most of their family. They've outlived some of their kids. And it's heartbreaking. It's hard. But they've got the greatest, um, Jeff Adams' mom and, and um, they, yeah, Sylvine, oh my gosh. They've got two of the greatest outlooks on life. And, and Sylvine, she really doesn't care. She'll cuss. You know, she just, she's okay. I mean, Lord, she's lived it. She lived through the Civil War. And, you know, both of them did. And, and just sitting between them today with those two bookends of both of them, it, it made me think about how short my life has been and many of ours and what their view of the world and history. But again, that 96, 97 years is nothing compared to eternity. That's what God sees, the eternal Son of God who humbled himself and also became a human being and in that became the Messiah, the Son of God, and God, God's self. And so that's powerful. That's powerful. That's who Jesus is. And that's who Jesus, and Jesus cares so much. He wants you to be in a relationship with him. It's not about us. It's about him. And when it's about him, it's about everybody else. I am so humble. I am so humble. All right. The good news of who Jesus is. There is the good news of what Jesus has done. He died on the cross, rose from the dead. And that's Paul, 1 Corinthians 15. Now, we're going to talk um, in the next chapter a little bit more about Paul. Um, and so we understand that this is what Jesus, who Jesus was and who Jesus is. There's good news of what he brings when he rose from the dead. He brought in this new creation and the power of the Spirit, Colossians 2, 13 and 15. Let me ask you this. This is a good question. Do you have the Holy Spirit in your heart and life? You may have Jesus in your heart and life, but do you, have you been um, blessed by the Holy Spirit? Now, in some denominations, that means you have to speak in tongues. We do not believe that that is a cause, effect of Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit cause in our view? In our view and across the street is almost identically the same as far as gifts of the Spirit. Your gift of the Spirit can be your gift of the Spirit. It may not be mine. Some of you are prophetic. That doesn't mean you read the future and read tea leaves. Prophetic means you see something and can decide how it's going to turn out. It's not magic. It's wisdom. Are you with me? That's prophecy. Prophecy. I don't know of any, any person that has the gift of prophecy that can figure out the numbers in the lottery. Okay? I haven't seen it. Have you? No? I mean, if I was prophetic and that was what I could predict the future, I would have bought up a bunch of land in Hart County and I'd be really wealthy right now. Okay, or I'd know where the next big bust is and where it's going to be great. Now, prophecy is when you have wisdom and can sort through information and figure out what's going to happen. That's prophecy. That's a gift. You know, there are many, many gifts. Um, Christy and all of us went through gifts of the Spirit. There's, there's like 20-something. You know, some of you have a gift of presence. What does that mean? If the Holy Spirit has come into your life and you have the gift of presence, sometimes you never have to say one word. You just have to be there. And when you're there, you make a difference to both people on each side of you. Do you understand that? It doesn't mean that we have to speak. We don't have to heal. You know what? All of us are healers. All of us have that gift. You know how I know that? Because the lame walk... The blind see because of what you and I do through the Lions Club and through all these different 
agencies and through things. We have given people the ability to walk that, that 50 years ago they could not walk. We've been given people the ability to see because now they have free glasses in third world countries. They would not have had that a couple of years ago. Do you understand that? You are in the healing business. Every one of you are in the healing business. And you've already done those things. So my question is, is the Holy Spirit a part of your life? And how does that spirit affect who you are and what you are and what you do for community? You know, because of that yellow house right there, there are people in their homes that would be kicked out of their homes because of what you put in the plate and your generosity. There are people that get food right over there because of what you do every Sunday, and you create miracles in people's lives. I don't know, but I I just had a chill thinking about all the lives that you have affected over all the years of your life and your generosity and your faithfulness. So yes, the Holy Spirit is in your life, and the Holy Spirit can even be more profound in your life. I've got a, a sweet member of our church that wants to serve so badly, but physically they just can't do it right now. And so I'm in prayer with that person to help that person kind of figure out their role. And I've got something planned, but they have to be healthy enough to do it. And so I'm encouraging them to just get healthy and get strong. Because who knows what God has in store for you. I, I watch you. I, I watch what you do, some of you, and, and how, how kind you are to those kids when they're running back and forth to the trash line and, and trying to get the rags to wipe up the spaghetti that they've ground into the carpet. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Some mom are sitting here. Um, do you see what the power of the Spirit is? Sometimes it's just being present. Sometimes it's saying something. Sometimes it's speaking truth. Sometimes. Sometimes it's making a decision that's a hard decision because it's a decision that needs to be made. Sometimes. And all of those work because the Holy Spirit gives us power to do that. Foolishness and weakness. Dear Lord, that's me. His death and resurrection not only brings salvation but also constitutes the ultimate refutation of the world's wisdom. Remember Paul said, I am a fool for Christ's sake. I'm a fool for Christ's sake. He also said, the word of the cross is folly for those who are perishing. But for those of us who are saved, it is the power of God. Because a crucified Savior makes no sense. It makes no sense. And the world, that's why the Muslims and um, Hindus and, and others think, why would you have a crucified Savior? That makes no sense. But the word of the cross, Paul says, is folly. They teach salvation through ascent. Remember, I mentioned that Sunday. But we preach salvation through descent. God coming and meeting us where we are. And the symbol in our church is the altar rail. This is the place where the sacred meets the profane. It's the altar rail. Because that's where um, you have communion. That's where you come up for holy baptism. The altar rail is the place where meeting between the sacred and the profane. That's the symbol of our church. It's also the symbol of the medieval church. Remember I told you the altar rail had nothing to do with religion. Do you remember? It was a railing that was there to keep animals out of the bread and wine. Originally it was a fence (laughs) with probably chicken wire. And then churches said, huh, that doesn't look good. Let's make it look better. And so they made it ornamental. And so the altar rail became a part of the chancel to keep animals out of the elements of Holy Communion. Because you don't want a pig wandering in and eating the body of Jesus. It just isn't good. And so churches took that and they made it ornamental. There was a time when organs were considered an instrument of um, just ugh, um, um, bad taste. And all of a sudden, huh. Let's make the pipes pretty, stick them back, put a cross on front, and we'll get somebody to play it loud and everybody will be happy, you know? Same thing with a guitar, same thing with everything else. Same thing with a piano. All right, take up your cross and give up your glory. 
Okay, this is the last part of chapter 5. Isaiah 53. He who had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people, if you read this whole text, what does it tell us? This points to whom? The early church saw this as a proof text for whom? The big J. That's right, the big J. Jesus. This points to Jesus because this says that, that he who saves us will go through agony and, and be rejected and all the things that the Christ goes through for you and for me. He was crushed for our iniquities. This is such an Easter text. It's a Good Friday text. The punishment that brought us peace was on whom? Him. Who is him? Jesus. Isaiah didn't know he was thinking about Jesus. But the early church figured it out. And by his wounds, we are what? Healed. It's a beautiful piece. John Calvin's paradox. He was sold to buy us back. I like this. Captive to deliver us. Condemned to absolve us. He was made a curse for our blessing, a sin offering for our righteousness, marred that we may be made fair. He died for our life so that by him fury is made what? That's the only way fury will ever be made gentle. There's not going to be any peace until Jesus is involved in it. Amen? Amen. That's the only peace that's going to count. Wrath appeased, darkness turned into light, fear um, reassured, um, despisal and despised. I can't read this. Debt canceled, labor lightened, sadness made merry, misfortune made fortunate, difficulty easy, disorder ordered, division un- united. How do you say that? Ignominy. Um, ennobled, that's a hard word to say together. Um, rebellion, subjected, intimidation, intimidated, ambush, uncovered, assaults, assailed, force, force back, combat, combated, war, warred against, vengeance, avenged, torment, tormented, damnation, damned, the abyss, sunk into the abyss, hell, transfixed, death, dead, mortality, made immortal, in short, Mercy has swallowed it all up, misery and goodness and all misfortune. And I'm going to add to that, Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen Amen. and amen. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I hope you have a marvelous evening. Hope you learned something, and we'll pick back up with Chapter 6 on Sunday. God bless you all, and I'll see you later. Thank you. Thank you. That was a hard piece to read. Goodness gracious.